here we're looking at uh, the ship in the gyre um, and various pieces of debris that they're picking up. Um, the, this is a sailing cargo ship called the Kauai. Um, and I, I mean, I, I think we should somehow get, I have it on a separate stick we could put in with the sound if that would be useful. I mean, okay. And <laughs> so uh, there's the Kauai and there's an example. The crew, because it's an inter-island cargo schooner, are very experienced at lifting heavy things on and off. That's one of our GPS satellite trackers, which we've been distributing to vessels of opportunity crossing the gyre to tag ghost nets. And those uh, broadcast every 12 hours until we can change their broadcast time. We do that so they'll be good for a year, year and a half, so we can use them to pick up. Somebody suggested, where, where did you see the lower right hand corner? Of this one? Here, we, this is the one. Okay. Let's see if any such. There we are. Come on up and show me what you think it is. It's the first time this has happened. When you played it on this computer before the sound came right on. Yeah, it's all the Anyway, you see the Kauai is quite a, a nice, okay, okay. There she was leaving Honolulu Harbor about May 22nd. Um, and the point of showing this to you is really to give you a sense of how much debris there is out there. Um, I'm proud of the fact that Ocean Voyages Institute came up with the idea for the GPS satellite trackers because one of the problems over the years of sailing to the gyre is we were always able to find the debris, but sometimes it took us days of sailing around. And when you're operating larger vessels for the financial efficiency, you want to be able to go right to the debris. And so our ocean has an amazing way of sorting things. And so actually the uh, 84,000, over 84,000 pounds of ghost nets and consumer debris that we brought in from this 25-day expedition we thought and it proved true that where there was one net we would find others in the area the trackers allowed us to do an efficient cleanup of over 40 tons of nets and consumer plastics we had someone posted up in the mass as a lookout, as well as two uh, drone uh, operators looking for uh, nets and other debris as we've been going along. And we've been sending out our small dinghy to collect smaller debris.
of our crew come from uh, the Line Islands, Kiribati. All of our deck and poles. Mm -hmm. And yet, it's just the beginning. We are spreading our program globally and inspiring cleanup all over the global ocean. And I'm asking everybody to help us increase the scope of what we're doing so we make a significant impact on the health of our ocean globally. Today is a triumphant time having removed all of these plastics from our ocean. Now we will be recycling and repurposing them. A small amount has gone to artists to create sculptures and paintings and educate people about these issues. The remaining amount is picked up by Snichter Steel and goes to Hawaii Power and is turned into energy for the homes of Oahu. We are committed in our expanding efforts to always recycle, repurpose, reuse the plastics we remove from the ocean. In 2020, we have already committed to this wonderful ship for three months and additional ships will be added. It will be a very exciting future. Please join us. Thank you. Oops. Huh. There we go. So, um, you know, just to quickly talk a little bit about our background that got us there and about the extent of the problem. Um, I founded the Institute in 1979 and in the early years we mainly did sail training and working a lot with marine scientists getting young people out on vessels for anywhere from day trips to month-long intensive programs. Um, and always with an ocean conservation educational aspect. But in 2009, I had reached a point that um, I was so alarmed by what I was seeing around the world. I've been lucky enough to go to places like the Galapagos Islands and the Tuamotus and Greece multiple times, and I began just seeing so much plastic in populated areas, in totally remote areas. And then I began also uh, reading articles and people saying, oh, you know, it's too far away. It's a plastic soup. To, you know, it's impossible to clean up. And from what I personally and my teams observe, uh, you know, there is huge amounts of debris, as you saw from the 25 days out there. They got a lot, and they were sorry they didn't have more time. The crew on this particular vessel put such effort and enthusiasm into picking up things, and most of them had spent their lives being maritime professionals and they thought it was the best project they've ever been involved in. So they're all very excited to uh, work with us this coming year. And that cleanup we did in 2019 was the largest cleanup that's ever been done in that gyre area, though we hope to do 10 times as much. Um, this year, we are going to be operating longer and with um, more ships. Oh, I'm so this um, shows a variety of our early trips. 
um, which came out of San Francisco, San Diego. We did trips up to Vancouver. Uh, but you sort of get a good sense the area where all the dots are closest is at the area that typically has the center of most debris. Um, you know, it moves around, but it's someplace out there halfway between the coast and Hawaii. So, um, you know, in we did a, a voyage in 2009 on Kaisei that I went on. We did a voyage in 2010. These were month-long voyages. And then in 2010, in the fall, we formed a think tank comprised of naval architects, marine scientists, fishermen, ocean industry people, oceanographers, and we looked at everything that we had figured out and kind of divided things into five categories of debris and came up with what we thought were the best cleanup solutions for each category. Um, the first category is the derelict fishing gear, the ghost nets. Uh, Kauai found uh, uh, a couple of boats out there that they picked up, uh, pieces of a fiberglass boat and about a 18-foot fiberglass fishing boat. You sometimes find docks and obviously to pick up these heavy things you need a cargo schooner or a work boat or a barge with crane uh, and maritime industry has lots of different options for that. The second category is all the floating consumer plastics. And um, they have a, an amazing way of coming together. Like I've seen four or 5,000 big white laundry detergent bottles and then miles of crates. And it's not that these things are dumped in the ocean together. It's that the currents sort of sort them. And so the idea of using fishing industry, purse-hanging nets and others, so that fish boats can fish for these consumer plastics, be paid to do that, help give fishing a break, and help fish stocks be restored um, is excellent. And you know, people always worry about what cleanup is doing to life in the ocean. But for example, unfortunately, when you're out in the middle of the ocean these days, you hardly see any ocean life because we've so overfished that it's very sparse. But um, you know, if one did in a net, a person net get any life, you could open a flap, let the life out. It's quite easy because plastic doesn't swim. So when your goal is capturing the plastics, uh, you can really do quite well. And the other good thing about using fishing and nets to do pickup is we have people all over the world coming to us wanting help with solutions. And our think tank is perfectly happy to work with whatever the local available fleets are and to help come up with good methods for that. So another thing you see out in the ocean, the gyre areas, is you'll come across current lines, which I'm sure many of you have seen. And they'll be filled with jagged pieces of plastic that have been obviously put, I don't know why it keeps going off, <laughs> been put through a crusher. And um, I think these have to be crushers on ships or crushers ashore places 
and uh, they get dumped in the ocean. I know I went and was a keynote speaker at a waste management conference, and the fellow said, after you're through, can you come and see a film? And they showed me a film of computer equipment being crushed in China. And along the conveyor belt were things that looked very much like what we saw millions of these crushed pieces in the ocean. Um, and oil skimmers end up being a really good way to pick up those pieces in the current line. So we haven't done that yet, but that's one of the things we want to experiment. One of our um, uh, think tank uh, manufactured them, and he has some really good ideas about how we can use them. So the next category is river debris. And, you know, once again, I think we can not reinvent the wheel, but use the technologies that the oil industry has come up with. Because really, all these plastics in our ocean is just another form of oil spill. And so uh, we can use this equipment, and I think it's very important to try to stop the flow from the rivers out into uh, to the ocean. Now the final um, category is the microplastics. And we have several people that have come to us with inventions, one's patented that they want to gift to us uh, about what they feel are solutions to microplastics. So while we're out there cleaning up the bigger pieces, we'll also be working on the microplastics. But I, you know, there, when you're out there and realize the volume of debris that's in the ocean, uh, people are frequently asking me, you know, how much debris is in our ocean? And truthfully, all sorts of people give different answers. But I think the best way to get a feel for that is, you know, back in the 1960s, we were manufacturing about 2 million tons of plastic a year. And probably in the last 30 years, we've been you know, the last 10 years anyway, it's been between 330 and 380 million tons of plastic manufactured every year. And, you know, I don't know which statistics are the most accurate, but it's, people say it's anywhere from 8.8% to 12.5% that gets recycled. So that means the rest of it lends, ends up in landfills or in the ocean. So, I mean, it's a huge issue. And frequently, one of the insidious things about plastic is they're so light that even if they end up in landfills, they um, can blow into rivers and into the ocean. So we, we have plenty of large stuff to clean up while we uh, figure out the best ways to remove this, the small things. So um, I, this is just sort of going over what you saw in the film. This trip was quite quick because we only had the use of the vessel for the 25 days, both because of the amount of money we had and the vessel's other commitments. But it, uh, using a sailing cargo ship is so energy, energy efficient and so appropriate for this kind of work. And from the publicity we've gotten, we now have nine ships wanting to work with us this year. And we won't 
use mine because I, unless we get a windfall, but uh, you will use three or four and for the longer period, thus really scaling up things. Um, so, uh, I think it skipped one. Okay, so one of the things I, I think all of you know, you're a very educated audience I'm speaking to here of, of people that have spent time on the ocean. You understand how much damage the ghost heads and the other plastics do. Uh, they do damage to reefs. Uh, they go against reefs and smother them and kill them. They kill whales and dolphins. They kill lots of fish. And they damage big ships and yachts. And so, um, you know, by removing the nets from the gyre area, we're actually benefiting a lot of reefs because we've had a couple of our tag nets. Actually, one landed on the north shore of Maui, and another one right now has just gone around the south point of the Big Island. So they've come from the gyre and they're heading to get reefs. And so um, that's an important globally, you know, our reef system is like the lungs of the ocean. So keeping healthy reefs is so urgently important. And they're so beautiful, as you all know. So, um, I gave quite a few talks in Hawaii, and um, I was asked by people out there, because Kaneohe Bay, unfortunately, gets a lot of reefs coming in, and so there were some big nets that had come and been on the reefs for over a year, and people had been talking to the Department of Harbors and the state and so they came and talked to us and we formed a partnership with the University of, uh, well, the Hawaii Pacific University, which had started a marine debris center. And we went and had people get in the water and loosen the nets from the reef and put uh, tethers on the nets so they could be hauled out to where we brought in a big ship that had the lifting capacity. And we removed uh, about 1,200 pounds of netting. And the scientists are now studying to see how long and how much of the reefs are going to be restored. And the state of Hawaii and NOAA and the Harbor Department have all said, can you keep doing this a couple times a year? And, uh, you know, I think it's something we would like to do in addition to our gyre cleanups, which we want to do. We're concentrating everything on the North Pacific gyre this year to show how much we can scale up. But we want to expand and have cleanups in all the areas of the world where they're needed. I'd love to think of us becoming a funding source that could give seed money to different operations. And I do think that cleaning up and helping to preserve reef systems that have been besieged by nets is extremely important. So that gives you a, so a sense of the size of what's there. Uh, so this is just talking. People have, have told me, um, you know, that uh, they think we should set our goals even higher than tenfold more. <laughs> but uh, we will be doing our best to get 
really significant amounts of debris cleaned up in 2020. And uh, something that uh, I also want to mention is we have some wonderful collaborations. We've been part of a NASA funded collaboration with the University of Hawaii and the Smithsonian and Scripps and the University of Washington and the University of British Columbia. So I'm sort of proud that Ocean Voyages Institute was chosen to collaborate. And at first, I wasn't sure how much we had to contribute, but they call us their eyes on the ocean because we've had lots of time out at sea. And it's been fascinating because there are uh, uh, wonderful uh, oceanographers and physicists and marine biologists sitting around the table with me, and they all speak different languages in terms of their disciplines. And so they're learning from each other. They're learning from me, and I'm learning from them. And so that's something we intend to uh, continue. And when we go out on our cleanup missions, we provide them samples of nets and samples of different things to help them with the studies there conducting. So, um, you know, a lot of people say, what can we do? And of course, in this group, one of the things we really need help with currently is uh, finding any vessels that are doing voyages back and forth that would like to carry some of our GPS satellite trackers and tag nets uh, because we have gotten funding. So we have like another 50 of these satellite trackers to deploy. And the more of them we get deployed, uh, the more efficient our scaled up cleanup will be. So that's a, a great thing any of you can help with. And of course, spreading the word. I mean, a lot of people know what's going on, but a lot of people don't. And so the more you can tell your friends and families and colleagues, and of course, part of scaling up means we need scaled up donations. And we've had some really wonderful supporters over the years, some of whom are here today, and I thank you. Um, and I welcome anybody to join in helping to support us and or to make introductions. I'm always happy to talk to anyone about our ocean cleanup and we deploy funds very effectively as Ron mentioned. And so, uh, and of course, uh, you know, reducing our use of plastic, I think is something that all of us are already conscious of and trying to do. So I wanted to keep my talk relatively short to leave good room for questions because I have a feeling you have some very worthwhile questions. And so I really appreciate your attention. This is a very heartfelt passion of mine. And I have a feeling many of you understand and are passionate about not accepting the precious resource of our ocean to be the world's garbage pail and preserving the life which preserves, you know, the ocean provides around 70% of our air. So for our health, we certainly need a healthy ocean. So thank you so much. Thank welcome, you. Welcome again to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Uh, our speaker today, Mary Crowley, founded 
ocean voyages, um, the uh, very sophisticated high-end uh, cruising tour business, and simultaneously, Ocean Voyages Institute, a 501c3 that's dedicated to cleaning up the oceans. Um, so Mary, um, it's kind of timely. On January 8th, the screenwriter Buck Henry died, and his one of his most famous movies, The Graduate, which I lucked out and happened to be on the set of when it was being filmed, when Mort Beebe, who's a frequent speaker here, was the second unit director on it. Buck Henry's biggest line out of The Graduate uh, comes when a, an older man <clears throat> steps up to Dustin Hoffman, a befuddled young Dustin Hoffman, and he points at Dustin Hoffman's chest many, many times, and he says, one word for you, young man, one word for you, plastics. So here we are, half a century later, and um, he was right, though his meaning has changed. Um, have you any scale of the amount of plastics in the ocean now? As I said, I, I see such different figures. I, and the truth is, I, I gave a speech in Washington, D.C. after our 2010 expedition. And there were many nonprofits there, many branches of government. And everybody agreed that we didn't need to try to study how much was there because we knew there, there was a lot that was killing the ocean and that we should concentrate all funds on cleaning it up. So then let's get to one of your great kind of innovations in a way. Talk to us about how the trackers work and how can other people place these trackers on a refuse that they see in the oceans? How big are they and how do you plant them on debris? Well, you, you saw a photo of one in the film and they're about the size of a soccer, soccer ball. ball. And, um, you know, they come with a tether and a carabiner. And there's a, a, a magnet that you remove um, the piece and it turns them on and you contact me and I turn them on at the other end. And then they began broadcasting every 12 hours. We have them sent for to preserve the battery life. We, we now have um, uh, a couple of things. We have some tagging that was done in 2018, like Jim Linderman, who was delivering a boat back from Pack Cup, tagged a net that was sort of mid-ocean. And it's a small net, and we prefer that people try to tag medium-sized nets. But he, What size would medium size be? No, medium size. Would, 30, 40 feet? What's medium? Would be, you know, 15 by 40 feet or 10 okay. by, you know, it, 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 it depends because it has three dimensions because, of course, it's how far down does it go. Mm -hmm. But he tagged a net that then came and looked like it was going to go ashore in Northern California. And then, you know, here it is like a year and a half later, and it just rounded the tip of the big island. So um, the other thing, it's not easy to do a good job tagging the nets. You ideally have a boat that you can launch a dinghy, and so you can bring the dinghy right up to the net and tag it. And the tricky part about the trackers is you want to tag it in such a way that it's close to floats if they're there or something because these nets, you know, are called ghost nets because they keep fishing. They keep rolling over in the ocean, catching fish, catching other nets, catching plastic. And if our trackers go down below the surface, then they stop broadcasting. And so sometimes, you know, because the scientists and I tend to watch them on a daily basis, and sometimes they'll disappear, and then two weeks later or a month later, they'll start broadcasting again. How deep can they go before they stop broadcasting? 
Well, if they're at all under the surface, like uh, two feet, three feet, four feet, they stop broadcasting. Okay. But uh, they can be down 30 feet and come back up and they'll start broadcasting again. So they're designed to be pretty durable. So now I'm going to keep asking questions until I see Charlie break a mic to somebody who's got a question. And we have one. And before we hear his question, I want to say that uh, there is one person in this room who is, whose fault it is that in 1991 I started doing this job. And that person who recruited me to the then Tuesday Yachtsman's Luncheon, we've changed the name over the years, is none other than my buddy, the Prince of San Francisco Bay, Don Beacons. Don, thank you, and you owe me. At a billing rate of $1,100 a year, a month, I think that you owe me about 3 or $4 million after these 30 years. Don, your question, sir. How many gyres are there? The question is, Charlie, make sure the mic's on. I, okay. How, well, the question was, how many gyres are there and where in the oceans are they? Um, the gyres that people talk about the most are the North Pacific gyre, which we're working in, uh, which is considered the area to have the most debris. Then there is a South Pacific gyre that um, ranges from off of Chile, where Easter Island is, to kind of off of French Polynesia. Um, then in the Atlantic, there's a North Atlantic gyre, which is uh, similar to the area of the Saragosso Sea and offshore there and um, there's a South Atlantic gyre and then there's the Indian Ocean gyre which they've considered one and which is a gyre that seems to be accumulating debris very quickly but if you consider the total system including the gyres in the Arctic and the Antarctic there's 11 gyres that keep waters flowing and the gyres are created by a combination of ocean currents and the movement of our planet. And, um, but then, you know, if you, since gyres are really areas of ocean current, there's many of them off of rivers and bays. So there's all sorts of countless small gyres that collect localized plastics as well. So those of us who sailed in the bay notice when there's a tide rip that you get um, debris right in the tide rip. Essentially two currents come cro across each other and we see debris gather. Is it the case that these gyres are big tide rips up where there's some cross currents with each other? Is that what's going on? What's causing the gyres to gather debris? It's a little bit more complicated than just um, the tide rip, but yes, it's formed by different currents. I, by the way, I get that criticism often. Ron, it's a little more complicated. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so it's a little bit more complicated than a tide rip, but it's a collecting spot in the oceans where more and more of the debris gathers. And you mentioned sorting, and I've seen this too out there. Um, so basically, like densities or something similar, they kind of gather together. I've seen a bunch of bottles and then lids over here. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. And that's, you know, the last year at the point that we were um, beginning um, our pickup, our 25 days, we had about uh, 25 trackers functioning. And to give you a sense of how effective these can be, we, they only picked up nine of the trackers to get the over 42 tons of debris. Wow, great. Half of the trackers, is said. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mrs. Perkins has a question. And thank you for bringing Johnny to these lunches. It's great. Is the microphone in Mrs. Perkins' hand? Yeah. 
Okay. Charlie, did you give her a mic? Okay, so Mrs. Perkins, a mother of four boys, I'll repeat your question. Really good question. So Mrs. Perkins, for there's almost nobody who doesn't know this, has sired four boys who are all really, this is a true word, brilliant sailors. And um, she brings them occasionally to these luncheons. And she wants to know, when you pick up the plastics, what are you doing with it? What can we do with it? And that is a great question. Thank you. I mean, what we did this last year um, was we gave some of it to artist and then to the graduate art program at the University of Hawaii and then we gave um, uh, the rest of it to Hawaii Power and they turned it into steam and powered the homes in Hawaii. This year because we're expanding what we're doing we're also going to expand uh, different things we'll be doing with it and we'll right now we're talking to three different companies that uh, convert plastics to fuel uh, which is uh, a good thing and we're trying to vet them they all would like to work with us and we're trying to figure out which one is the best in terms of environment and efficiency and all of these things. And then, um, you know, one thing that's interesting is plastics become more valuable if you're able to sort different types of plastic. I mean, one of the nice things about turning it into energy or turning it into fuel is you can take all plastics and put it through this process but if you're able to sort the plastics then they can be used for making rugs or making glasses some uh, eyeglasses or uh, different types of things and you know my passions are sailing the ocean environment but also you know I care a great deal uh, about human beings and there's a lot of Pacific Islands and other islands around the world that don't have much employment. So I think it would be very fascinating to start some recycling centers there that could offer employment and um, be able to sort the plastics and turn it into even more products. But. Okay, so now you gathered on a cottage industry sale 40 tons. How much did it cost for your cottage industry operation to gather 40 tons? What was the raw cost, out-of-pocket cost? Uh, well, the, the cost, including the cost of the uh, trackers, mm -hmm. uh, came to around $280,000. So 280000 bucks to get 40 tons. We all know that when you go industrial, things get way, way less expensive, you know, comparing anything that becomes industrialized. So have you any awareness of businesses who have some interest in your plastic that you're gathering? Or are there any industrial activities that you know of to gather plastics in the ocean? Have you seen any inkling of it from anywhere yet? Oh, quite a few people have come to us with interest in potentially purchasing plastics. The debris that you're gathering? Yes. Um, though, you know, it, so, so we're responding and exploring and seeing. Personally, I don't think it makes huge amounts of sense to ship our plastics to Europe. There's a lot more going on in Europe in terms of things to do with plastic. But a lot of what's happening with plastic is people are making clothes out of plastic. And I have very mixed feelings about that and have to date not chosen to go that path because that creates lots of microplastics. So, I mean, I'm trying to really solve problems, 
not make additional problems by what I'm doing. Okay, so, so the plastic is gathering in the gyres. That is accumulating in gyres. Is it coming down rivers? How is it getting into the ocean in the first place? And what activities have you seen to successfully somehow filter what comes out of the rivers? First, is it coming from the rivers? Where is it coming from? Well, it, it's coming from rivers and watersheds. I mean, as we've all seen, I mean, here we are in, um, you know, a place that is quite environmentally conscious. And in both San Francisco Bay and Los Angeles, you know, every fall when the rains come, big amounts of plastic walk, wash out into the ocean. So, um, you know, and in a lot of the world, the rivers and the beaches are actually used, as, they don't have garbage systems. They're the sewer system. So they're used, so. In India, as I've been in India, I've seen that you know, junk is flowing down the rivers. Right. So that's why I'm leading me to the question about how, have you seen any filtering or ways that you can have any kind of active filter so you don't just catch the fish, you catch plastics? Have you seen any? Well, you know, what I was saying is I think that the oil industry equipment being put in rivers and river mouths can catch the plastics and um, that is on our list. But, you know, we're sort of starting with the gyres that because they are killing so, the plastics there are killing so much of the life in the ocean and the reefs. But, um, you know, we will be getting around to helping people with stopping the river flow. But it's not just rivers. It's rivers and watersheds. Great. So we have a question from Dr. Lynn Beacons. Lynn. So we're going to repeat Lynn's thoughtful question. She said, can you outline the private and public collaborations that you see in your future? Because government has money for things like this. And what's going on with you collaborating with businesses and, and uh, government? Um, Thanks, Lynn. I, obviously, uh, collaboration and expansion is all very, very important. You are correct. I mean, people like NOAA praise our work, want to help us in any ways they can, but they say they don't even know if they'll have jobs the next year. And so they are not able to help with funding. Uh, so most of our funding has come from family foundations of people that are uh, passionate about environment, passionate about climate, passionate about sailing. Um, and, and I really believe, you know, a lot of people talk about, um, you know, how can you make the plastic more valuable? And uh, I think what needs to happen is we need a couple more years of really successful cleanups and expanding in all the ways um, I mentioned. And then I think we'll be able to start doing more of what they do in Europe is taxing people manufacturing plastics so that they're paying for the recycling of the plastics. And that's going to accomplish a lot of good because one of the problems with all the throwaway plastics in the world and plastic recycling period is plastics too cheap. 
but if you make plastic more expensive because it's taxed or um, paying recycling fees, well, then um, plastic isn't going to be a good throwaway material. So you're so. saying life cycle costing, essentially yes. Yes. life cycle pricing, right. not just the price to make that plastic, but the price to responsibly dispose of it later. Yes, right. okay. I, I think that's the solution. Great. Mark Lambros has a question. Mark. Let's see if this is working. Oh, it is. So uh, going back to the tax, we are taxed right now for all the bottles we pay, five cents, ten cents on, on every bottle. Have you thought about going to the state board to get some of that money to do the recycling of the, all the bottles that we pay to ship out to the Pacific? And one other question is, is this issue occurring in the Atlantic? Uh, yes, the issue is, to answer the second question first, it is uh, definitely occurring in the Atlantic. It's occurring in the Mediterranean. There's huge problems. It, it's really a global issue. It just, uh, you know, our North Pacific, I, I, I think, has gathered the most. And so it's a great place to perfect our methods and from which to, um, as we learn, to share the technologies and get cleanups happening happening all over and um, you know I have not gone after the five cent bottle money but that could be a good thing to do and if any if you're interested in pursuing that for us I would love that I mean I'm right now personally concentrating on both fundraising and planning, choosing which of the vessels, negotiating the vessels give us special prices because they all believe in what we're doing. But I'm putting together a lot of things for our major May expedition and trying to deploy the trackers. But, yes. So I want to say one good thing about the gyres is it's actually a collecting spot. I like that bunch of junk. It's brought to one location because it's easier to pick it up when it's gathered there. I'm sorry it's getting there, but I think we could see the gyres as being kind of nature's way of helping us a little bit fix the problem that we've caused. Now we have another question. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, source reduction is kind of what you were talking about with the taxation. That kind of reduces the sources. Also, uh, producer responsibility and take back on especially bigger items where they have to dispose of them. And the third thing is, Mary, and you all can answer this, why not require that all net fishermen put those trackers on all their nets? Well, that's... Built a, into the product, you say. Yeah. That's correct. And that's what all of us that get involved with this um, say. I mean, everybody that gets the opportunity to go out there says, why don't we require that the nets all be tagged? Um, and So this is a thoughtful idea, and you could even do it after market, right? You could basically, even if you can't get um, the net people to immediately put tags on the nets, you could go to stores, wholesalers, wherever nets are sold, and require that before they sell the net, they have to put some kind of trackable tag on it. Okay. Yes, no, that is good. I, I just think there's a lot of, I, I mean, I think one of the big sources of nets is the very substantial illegal fishing industry because there's the, these big ships out there totally illegally and lots of them. And if planes... This isn't one coming in now, is it, Mary? Look, can you tell? <laughs> Don't they need... Tags on their nets? <laughs> but um, in any instance, if planes or boats come close to them, they cut their nets because they can get heavy fines and get their ships confiscated. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of people buying lots of nets that definitely don't want them tagged. And I'm afraid they have more influence than I do. But that doesn't mean that 
eventually that it would be wonderful if nets were tagged and you would think because I mean nets are valuable so good fishermen don't want to lose a net they lose a net only when you know it's rough and it's dangerous for them to try to retrieve it or it's caught on something and they don't have a big enough crew to untangle it so um, Grace Knight has a question Grace well mine is, is kind of an observation and you get to make the question and give me an answer at a table conversation of, of them not people that were involved in sailing or fishing or the environment just people they don't care basically and we also talked about well how can we live without plastic you can't everything has a container and I live in an apartment complex we can't even get the tenants to fold a cardboard box flat how and they don't compost you can compost but they don't want to be bothered because there's a garbage disposal and basically they don't care so how can we make them care so there's not a bigger problem? Well, that's a good, we got it, Grace. How yes. can we cause more people to realize this danger? Understand it. Yes, size of well, danger. well, I mean, when my dear friend and mentor, Sylvia Earle, talks about what is the biggest problem for our ocean, she always says ignorance. It's the fact that people don't understand that a healthy ocean is key to our own health. It's key to the air we breathe. It's key to the climate situation. And so uh, it's ignorance. And I think um, all forms of education on this issue, I mean, I try to, uh, we do a lot of presentations to schools. If we had money, we do more special film clips to distribute to schools uh, because education is important. And I mean, one of the things that I find shocking is it's so documented that drinking water out of plastic bottles, particularly in warm climate areas, but every place, is so bad for you. You're, absorbing plastics and chemicals and all sorts of things that are very unhealthy and people just don't seem to understand that and uh, it's sort of a mystery. I have a house that I welcome lots of sailors and international people all the time when I'm there and the house sort of goes on when I'm not there. And I'll come back from my travels, and about half the time, there will be a plastic bottle someplace <laughs> in my house. And I think, who brought this? How could they dare leave it here? What do I do with it now? Because that's the problem, too. A lot of times, you know, things are being, quote, unquote, recycled, and they're not really being recycled. And so, you know, there's a lot of things to look into in the recycling industry. I mean, I, I don't want to cast any whatever, and I don't know, but people have told me in Marin, you know, they, we separate our garbage, and people say, and then the truck comes and it dumps it all together. So, you know, it's recycling is important and it needs to be done properly. But I think reducing consumption um, and, you know, innovation in materials, I mean, uh, I may sound a little whatever, but I mean, if, if I'm given an option of plastic forks and knives, I, I will eat with my fingers. I mean, I don't like using plastic. And you can't avoid it all, as you say, unless some people do. And if you put enough time and ingenuity into it. But, you know, avoiding a lot of it, if a lot of us avoid a lot of it, it creates change and it makes people 
you know, if we support places that are having good environmental standards, I mean, some resorts now don't use plastic. Some charter boats don't use plastic. And if you support people with your dollars and purchases that are doing good environmental educational things, that helps. So it's fitting, Mary, from Chicago that our next questioner, uh, Rick and Candy Rundle, are in fact here visiting from Chicago. So Rick, you have a question? I do. A friend of mine, uh, Joe Lonerbrand, a world champion in the star class, good sailor. was uh, shipping his boat or his brand new star boat back in a container and in a storm what falls overboard but the upper containers so i always thought about this star boat floating around in the currents of the sea so a number of years ago i heard on npr radio a uh, author with a book called moby duck and it's about the, the currents and how all this plots them and jots them it's in the, the book Moby Duck was written by Donovan Hahn. I'm sorry, I need a little feedback. Uh, by Viking Press in March of 2011. So anyone would like more information on where the currents go and how much garbage is out there. This is a book that was written nine years ago. and It hasn't gotten any better except for people like Mary Crowley trying to make it better. And we all have to make it better. Thanks, Thanks, Rick. Thanks, Mary. And thank you, Ron. You got that. So, so Mary, whose work do you respect? What other, uh, you know, environmentalists or organizations are trying to clean up, uh, get plastics out of the oceans? That, who do you respect? Well, there's a, a few people. There's a, a wonderful uh, Swedish fellow, Joachim Oldenburg, who um, has given us a right to use some of his underwater footage. And he got the uh, Swedish government to back him with picking up several hundred tons of nets off the coast of Sweden. And um, so he and I collaborate and talk about each other's work and have plans. I, I also have a colleague in Hong Kong, a wonderful uh, lady who has been doing cleanups of Hong Kong Harbor and working with the fishermen What's there. What's her name? Uh, her name's Sharon Kwok. Actually, I'll introduce you the next time you would enjoy meeting her, Ron. She uh, was a, originally a movie star in kung fu movies. And then she uh, married into a very substantial old uh, Hong Kong family and her husband Stanley is just lovely and both of them care a lot about the ocean environment and uh, they'll they'll be here in the spring great um, you could consider hosting other folks who have a like mind out here at, at our yacht club Mary hosting a conference of people who are wanting to clean up the ocean we have another question from the audience yes hi the one problem I see with converting people to, you know, getting them to be passionate about this is um, is that the plastics, and I think the, the reason for the success of the plastic industry is how convenient it is. And this, I, among all others, I just love convenience. So um, I'm just wondering, um, also, um, that's just the thing. We have to be believe in the cause, and I have a holistic view, and I do share that holistic view. However, I'm wondering if there are other things besides technically plastic, like all of the, um, the the endless cups of coffee, the disposable coffee cups, et cetera, et cetera, do those also contribute to this problem? There's oh, so many. Yes. I mean, yeah. I mean, a lot of things are lined with plastic. Um, and, uh, but, you know, it's so much nicer. I mean, I go and get my coffee in a mason jar. Most people use aluminum uh, containers. I mean, it's it's so much nicer than dealing with plastic and plastic lined cardboard um, to uh, bring your own stuff. And, you know, having your own stuff in your car when you're taking food to go or there's so many things. And, and I guess plastic, quote unquote, is convenient. 
but the more you become aware of how bad it is for your health, the less convenient it seems. It just seems more disgusting. And when you get involved in cleaning it up, which is why I'm a great advocate, whether you're cleaning your own yard or a neighborhood cleanup or a park cleanup or a beach cleanup or a at sea cleanup, uh, you know, when you pick up plastic in nature, it really makes you not want to have it in your life. So, last question, sir. I just have a couple quick questions. But first Mike, of all, I, get the mic close. Oh, there is that better? Thank you. Uh, appreciate your efforts, first of all, and I realize that you probably get this all the time. But has there been any um, efforts or and you know of anybody that's pushing for regulation around this the fishing nets? And I was actually surprised to see how much of the debris that you're collecting is fishing nets. Um, I I just assume a bunch of plastic floating around, but that's that's assumptions. Um, and and then the next question is, um, well, I, the idea would be to to regulate the nets somehow. It seems to be some sort of international component. But as you say, there's so much illegal fishing that 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 would be almost impossible to regulate. But there has to be some way to, 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 to realize how many nets they're going out with and how many they're coming back with. I mean, it's, 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 it's got to be something there. The next piece. Yes. Uh, one thing I want to be sure to point out is, you know, we had tagged nets. We were going for nets. We still ended up with probably four tons of consumer plastics. Right. Um, but there's more consumer plastics out there than there are nets. So I'm, I'm not wanting to make this a problem of fishing industry. They're part of it, but it's humanity's problem. So with that, we want to thank Mary Crowley, founder of Ocean Voyages Institute, for the great work you're doing cleaning up. And those of you who want to help Mary directly uh, on the web, Ocean Voyages Institute.org. Institute uh, thank you so much, Mary. It's great to, to see you again and have your great work, uh, you know, on view at the Wednesday Outing Luncheon. And with that, our Wednesday Outing Luncheon at the St. Francis Yacht Club is adjourned.